everybody has read the catalog because I came yesterday and bought it to see what was in it. And most of what I have to say is in there. So <laughs> uh, and that's probably to be expected because I'm not really an expert in this area. Um, my field is 17th century. And if I came up with something completely original, it would probably be a little bit off base. Um, let's see. I need my. Um, I wanted to start talk, um, showing you a few images of uh, work that precedes Ai Weiwei. Um, Ai Weiwei was uh, born in 1957, and um, you know his personal background has certainly. I think influenced what he does in his art and influenced uh, a whole generation of artists who grew up about the same time. Um, Ai Weiwei's father, Ai Qing, was uh, a very well-known poet, uh, a leftist, a Communist Party member, uh, but someone who in 1958, I believe, was um, labeled a rightist in one of the anti-rightist campaigns that was carried out um, under in the early decades of the, the PRC, the People's Republic of China. And so um, his father and then the family consequently were exiled to uh, the province of Xinjiang, which is in the far northwest of, of China. Um, and they lived there for um, <clears throat> about 16 years. Uh, Ai Weiwei eventually then came back and entered the uh, Beijing Film Academy. It, he was in the first class um, that was taken after the end of the Cultural Revolution. And the Cultural Revolution, um, the dates are 1966 to 1976, uh, when uh, Mao died and the Cultural Revolution ended shortly thereafter. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple of works that date. Uh, this one, uh, Rent Collection Courtyard, 1965, just prior to um, the Cultural Revolution period, but a work that was very important during uh, that time. It is um, a sculptural work on site in Sichuan in a landlord's, uh, former landlord's house. And it is meant to represent um, the conditions under which peasants lived in the pre-1949 period, um, and also ultimately changes were made to it during the Cultural Revolution period um, to <clears throat> make it bring it into closer conformity with uh, what was called Mao Zedong thought at the time, and to sort of uh, make uh, some of the, the characters in the end scenes in which you see the peasants rise up uh, and overthrow the, the landlord, um, sort of representative of that kind of thought. Uh, and then this, another very famous work from the Cultural Revolution, you know, Chun Hua's Chairman Bao goes to Anyuan, and uh, a majority of work that was done during the Cultural Revolution period does feature Chairman Mao. I don't want to imply what I think some people uh, believe about these kinds of works that because they are propagandistic works, which they certainly are, that you know the artist had absolutely no um, <clears throat> input into what was being done. That you know the, that these are just purely propaganda and therefore not art. Um, in fact, the artist of this work um, has, in recent years, been interviewed, and he talked quite a bit about you know what he did to create this work, the research that he did, all the things he thought about, and in fact his struggles with some of the authorities who wanted him to make changes in it. But it is the case that for artists of Ai Weiwei's generation, um, you know, growing up in the People's Republic of China, that both content and style were um, constrained by the Communist Party, by the government. Um, you know, these works were supposed to serve the people. Um, the, the style that was considered most appropriate uh, for this was socialist realism, a style that was borrowed from the Soviet Union. Um, certainly some changes were made uh, so that you know, it incorporated some aspects of Chinese style from Russian ink painting in some cases or from woodblock prints. But 
in every case, you know, these works were really, uh, you know, the, the artists did not have complete freedom in, to uh, create whatever they wanted. And so with the end of the Cultural Revolution, when um, things started to loosen up a little bit in China, and artists began to uh, be able to uh, read books that were published outside of China uh, that might not have been approved earlier, um, that they were able to read books from China's earlier history uh, that might not have been approved earlier. They tended to um, sort of move in one of three directions. Um, in this period, beginning in the 80s, you begin to see artists creating works um, in which they cite as influences uh, mainly these three schools of thought. Um, Taoism, which uh, Taoism is a kind of umbrella term for a lot of religious and philosophical beliefs in China. Uh, in this case, I think they're mainly interested in what's called philosophical Taoism, which has to do with uh, the human being as an individual rather than as um, you know a sort of cog in society. It's often kind of set in opposition to Confucianism in which you know, human beings are really considered in terms of various social relationships and their duties um, and the benefits that they derive from those relationships. Uh, Taoism is really more about the individual and about um, the, the humankind's um, relationship to nature and the human as a natural being. And it's often, it, there are a number of metaphors in Taoist texts that have been used throughout China's history to kind of talk about uh, the spontaneity of the artist. Um, Chan, or Zen, as it's more commonly known in uh, the United States, and as the Japanese pronunciation, is a form of Buddhism that seems to have been created in China. I think most people think that. I know that some of my friends who specialize in Indian things think that that could possibly be the, the case. But um, as far as we know, it is of Chinese origin. And um, it is a school of Buddhism that is kind of anti-rational. Uh, it embraces intuition as a means to gain enlightenment. It embraces spontaneity and humor. And so uh, that became very attractive to many uh, artists of, of this period as they were kind of exploring their own heritage. And then also another um, uh, sort of school of thought that was uh, very influential early on was Dada. And uh, Dada, of course, I'm sure you all know, it's a literary and artistic movement that originated in Vienna during World War I. And it's a reaction to the horrors and absurdities of that period. Uh, and so it also kind of embraces an anti-rational approach um, to, um, to art as a, as a means of a kind of critique. So for some of these Chinese artists, they really saw a lot of overlap between these, these um, three schools of thought. Uh, there certainly are others that are also important in this period, but these are three that are very frequently cited. Um, in 19, let me get the year right, 1981, Ai Weiwei moved to New York, and he went to New York with the intention of not returning to China. He intended to spend the rest of his life there, he says. And um, you know, initially he uh, he learned English. Uh, he got into the Parsons School of Design, but dropped out uh, very uh, very soon thereafter. Apparently, because he didn't like the way art history was being taught. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. Um, and from that point, he was kind of hanging around. He was an illegal alien. He was. Uh, doing a variety of jobs, but he was living in the East Village. Um, one of his neighbors was Allen Ginsberg. He got to know um, many Chinese artists that were living in the area, um, as well as um, you know uh, American artists, other artists that were living in the New York area. And one of the the great influences on him from this time was the works of Duchamp. Uh, some of which he would have seen in the Museum of Modern Art, um, but also in other collections. And so I just brought in uh, an example of, of 
one of these, Marcel Charles Duchamp's uh, bicycle wheel. And um, I think the, the reason I wanted to bring this in is because the idea of the ready-made is something that when, well, it, even when um, Ai Weiwei was in New York, he was already creating some work. Um, I don't think he was creating a great deal. He didn't have a lot of money at the time. Uh, and what he did create, I think much of it has been destroyed. He said that you know he moved around a lot and he had to just leave a bunch of it behind. Um, but he was doing things that were, whoops, that's not right, sorry. <laughs> Can't see the buttons up here. Uh, doing things that were somewhat similar. Uh, this is one of his early works from that period. This is called Hanging Man. Uh, and it is a, a coat hanger that's bent into the shape of the profile of Marcel Duchamp's uh, face, uh, based on his death mask, apparently. And um, the, on the left is just the work itself. On the right, I like this because he, it's on the floor and he's put uh, the shells of sunflower seeds, which uh, ties in with uh, the work upstairs, um, to fill in part of the, the face. Uh, so this was a, an influence very early on. On um, the left is another of his works from this period, Violin, which is a violin with the handle of a shovel. And that relates pretty directly, I think, to another work that's in MoMA um, in advance of The Broken Arm by Marcel Duchamp. So, you know, Marcel Duchamp was the person that coined the term ready-made. He came up with this idea of going out and just using objects that he found um, in works of art and sort of altering them in many cases uh, in order to kind of undercut their function or you know just to uh, perhaps play with the form uh, and so on. <clears throat> so eventually um, Ai Weiwei did return to China in 1993 and he um, uh, his, he returned for one reason because his father was very ill. And when he went back, he again found that he uh, he really didn't have a lot to do in in Beijing initially. Um, you know, it, it, even at that time, it wasn't uh, the case that one could you know just sort of very easily go out and and get oneself a job, for instance. Um, but he started to go antiquing quite a bit. And um, he was buying and selling antiques and collecting some things himself. And it seems to be from this experience that he decided to begin um, you know, using some of these objects that he found at antique markets uh, in his own work. And so this is one of his uh, very early kind of more iconoclastic works. Uh, from 1995, dropping a Han Dynasty urn, which um, you know, this is upstairs in, uh, in the exhibition. One of his best known images. It is a performance piece that documented in these three photographs. Um, the urn that he is breaking is, um, it is a Han Dynasty urn, I think, and some people have suggested that perhaps he was using a replica but uh, I, I don't believe that to be the case. I think he is, he is using it. And um, it is a very sort of deliberate, provocative kind of gesture. This is the, the type of piece that um, he's dropping. This is a, it's a tomb jar uh, from the Eastern Han Dynasty, so um, uh, 3rd century. And um, you know, so this is something that it, it was made as a tombware. Um, these sorts of things were um, not initially collected in China. They were, in fact, kind of taboo in a way because they were associated with death. And it was only because foreigners began collecting uh, tomb artifacts of this type, vessels and figurines and, and various things uh, that were placed in people's graves in order to accompany them into the afterlife. Um, but certainly it is a kind of recognizable object that you might see in a museum now. Um, so, you know, he is taking an authentic work and uh, smashing it here. And, you know, he has been asked about, you know, whether he is deliberately commenting on, you know, China's own history and culture. And 
generally he says no because um, you know, he says, well, he's Chinese, and these are the things that were at hand for him. So he is using, you know, what was at hand. If he were from another culture, he would use different sorts of things. But nonetheless, I think, you know, there are, of course, like certain associations with some of these objects that he works with. And one of the things that has uh, come up that, you know, he himself has uh, agreed with this interpretation is that um, this relates back in a way to the Cultural Revolution period during which um, young people um, were, you know, organized into these groups that sort of broadly are called Red Guards, and they were supposed to smash or get rid of the four olds, um, old culture, old habits, old thoughts, and so on. And there was quite a bit of destruction of cultural artifacts during this period, um, either by Red Guards going into, you know, uh, temples and things like that, you know, and, and hacking things apart, burning them. Um, or, you know, there were even many cases where people destroyed things that they owned, that they had made. There are many cases of Chinese artists who, um, you know, burned their own work at this time because the styles in which they were painted or made weren't acceptable in this period, and uh, so you know they needed to get rid of them in order to, <coughs> sorry, protect themselves. Um, so you know there may be a reference to that sort of uh, to that recent history, um, but certainly also I think that this has to do with uh, just the idea of how we define art. Um, this it has been uh, an important question in Dada, and uh, it remains an important question, I think, throughout all of Ai Weiwei's move. Um, what is art, uh, and who gets to decide when something is art? How do we decide value? Many people find um, the work of this type rather shocking because he is taking a, a cultural artifact, a historical object, and, and destroying it. Um, he himself says that the Chinese people don't really place as much value on these things as Westerners seem to do, uh, which, which may be the, the case largely, although I'm sure that there are plenty of Chinese uh, curators and art historians who might <laughs> disagree with them on that. Um, so, you know, it may partly be, uh, be cultural, again. Um, but there is also, I mean, he's also playing into a whole history of uh, destruction of art objects, which does really kind of start with the Dada, Dadaist. I mean, some of the uh, Dadaists created, like, self-destroying sculpture. Um, this is a very famous example. I'm sure a lot of you know this. Uh, Robert, oh, I've got Rauschenberg's name so wrong. Sorry, Robert Rauschenberg uh, erased the Cooney drawing of 1953, and you know Rauschenberg went to de Kooning's studio. Uh, he did not know de Kooning. Um, he was a younger artist of uh, less, you know, reputation than de Kooning at the time, and asked him for a drawing that he wanted to erase. And so this was something that was done with the, um, the other artist's uh, you know, agreement. He, de Kooning himself, picked out the piece, and he picked out something deliberately that he knew he would miss. Um, he picked out something that was difficult to erase, not just a pencil drawing, because he wanted Rauschenberg to have to work at it. And uh, Rauschenberg said that it took about two months for him to erase the piece entirely. Um, but you know, this is what remains. And uh, although you know this is uh, a destruction in a way, uh, it's also a, a creation in a way because it has become a kind of touchstone um, for a lot of later work. Uh, other people who have done similar kind of things, Jake and Dina's Chapman, um, insult to injury. Uh, they purchased an entire, apparently, in very good uh, condition, a set of prints of uh, Francisco de Goya's Disasters of War, um, and then went in and painted over it. And as you can see on the right, they've added uh, a clown's face. 
So, you know, this work originally was about the horrors of war, and then the Chapmans used it in this very provocative way um, to kind of comment on, sort of bring it into the 20th century and use it to comment on what was going on in the world um, then. So, you know, there, there is a lineage to this, and in fact, I think if you know this, uh, I always dropping the Han Dynasty urn begins to seem a little bit less shocking because there are all these precedents for it. Um, this is a couple of Neolithic period jars. He's also used quite a few of these. If you see the exhibition upstairs, uh, you know this already. And I bring in two that are types that he did purchase. Most of the things he's used have not been painted pottery. They've just been um, unpainted earthenware pieces that are pretty pedestrian. Uh, but he has used some works like this that have painted images. Um, again, these are not necessarily things that, uh, you know, he himself says, well, they're not really museum quality. Uh, I think economics kind of uh, uh, affects what he, what he has bought. He hasn't bought something hugely expensive for the most part, which he would then destroy or, or paint over. Um, but on the right, we have the urn with the Coca-Cola um, logo on it. And then on the left are um, other Neolithic jars that have just been dipped into paint. Um, the, so, you know, part of this has to do, again, with just kind of defacing the object in some way and taking, you know, an op something that could be regarded as an art object in one context and doing something to it so that now it's regarded as an art object in a different kind of socio-historical context. Um, the presence of the Coca-Cola logo certainly could also be related to um, you know, consumerism in uh, China, uh, changes in uh, Chinese political and economic philosophy that have allowed you know, for uh, really kind of <laughs> uh, almost the overrunning of some big cities by uh, Western companies. And there are lots of other artists that have done work of a similar kind. This is Wang Guangyi's great criticism, Coca-Cola. He did a whole series of these in which he combines cultural revolution period imagery with logos. And for him, I think this is really about the kind of uh, sexiness of visual language. He's drawing comparisons between the kind of language that's used to sell products like Coca-Cola and the language that was used to sell ideas um, in, under the PRC, and particularly the Cultural Revolution. Um, <clears throat> And then, of course, um, Iowa takes that even further in works like Dust to Dust. Um, you see in the back there this cabinet with all these jars filled with dust. And each one of those is um, one of these Neolithic jars that has been ground up into dust. So now that it's been completely obliterated. I'm going kind of fast because I want to get to a couple of the other things I wanted to talk about. I'm almost out of time already. Um, and I just you know, wanted to bring in Marcel Duchamp's most famous work, The Fountain, which is, of course, a urinal that he just signed his name to. And then it was, um, you know, he tried to submit it to an, at, at an exhibition, which it was uh, rejected. Uh, this is one of the number of replicas that have been made. Uh, but this, of course, was also kind of an act of destruction, not actually physical destruction, but an act that was trying to sort of destroy, call into question the line between what is art and what is not. Right? So this is very much of Duchamp's lineage. And uh, this exhibition deals with um, ceramics, but he also works with furniture. On the left is a piece that is recreated from some, uh, a 17th century table. Um, he's done a lot of work with uh, furniture from the Ming and Qing dynasties. On the right is a sculpture that is created from recycled bicycles, so more recent vintage. Um, in regard to both the, the bicycle work, the forever, and then also some of the other ceramic pieces, another aspect of this is that he does not do all this work himself. Uh, he does, um, he has craftsmen 
who are experts in woodworking, um, in uh, you know, metalworking, and um, in terms of the ceramic work, you know, he goes down to the city of Jingdezhen, which has been a place where ceramics have been produced for mm, a thousand or more years, uh, and gets artists there to create things for him. So in that sense, his work is somewhat similar to the work of Jeff Koons, who also, he comes up with ideas and then just turns them over to other people to manufacture them. I think his relationship with those craftsmen is a little bit uh, closer than that of Jeff Koons, uh, because you know he says that he uh, likes to give them very challenging tasks and see how well they'll be able to, to uh, do them. Um, on the left is his work, uh, Blue and White Moon Flask, which is a replica of a Qinlong period um, work, and I brought one in on the right. And of course, so here he's really dealing with issues of authenticity and kind of undermining our whole idea of, uh, you know, what is authentic, what is not. Uh, if you make a perfect replica of a Qinlong period flask, is I mean, is it any of any less value than a um, actual Qinlong period flask? Um, you know, it, it's sort of. Uh, I think he really likes to make himself uncomfortable and his audience uncomfortable in, in different ways. One of Jeff Koons' works, one of my favorites. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then uh, um, this work on the left, Ghost Goo, is upstairs, and here he's taken that uh, a yuan, the you know original uh, vessel type of Yuan Dynasty jar that has a narrative scene painted on the exterior and kind of inverted it. He's turned it inside out. So he's not really here dealing with um, you know like changing the function, making things unfunctional, which is something he often does. But he's making the decoration unfunctional because you can't really see it. And I really wonder if he didn't set uh, the Jing De Jin, um, ceramic ceramicist to this because it would be very challenging and he wanted to see how well the, the, uh, they would do it. And then um, just quickly, this is the um, sunflowers, Guayuaza and sunflower seeds, which is upstairs. Um, and I wanted to show you the installation at the Tate, uh, which was a whole room that was the floor of which was covered with these. Each one of these is a separate porcelain seed form, hand painted. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, go to the Tate Gallery site and watch the video there. There's a great video that shows you people working on these. And so, I mean, this, you know, it also, it certainly engages the idea of authenticity. What looks like sunflower seeds is not. Um, he said that, you know, sometimes people want to pick them up and put them in their mouth. Um, the, um, you know, but also I think you know, it's, it's interactive. Um, when you walk through it, it makes sounds. Unfortunately, it didn't for very long because apparently it was creating so much dust that they had to close it and people couldn't actually go out into it anymore. They had to observe it from uh, the, the exterior, which I think made it a little bit less powerful. Um, but also, the, uh, one other thing I just wanted to bring up, oh, I wanted to show you other artists who were dealing also with ceramics and having things produced at, at Jin De Jin. So this kind of language pulling on things from Chinese history is very, uh, very common. Um, but also, I think kind of the, um, the uselessness of the, the product, the, the fact that it seems to be kind of wasted labor is an idea that has engaged a lot of, of Chinese artists. Uh, another artist you may be familiar with is Xu Bing, who created 3,000 fake characters. He spent, oh wait, 2,000 fake characters, I think. He spent three years um, producing all of these characters, using parts of real characters, but making up a character that has no meaning, and then carving them into type, and using that to print books. And so in the end, you have this whole installation of books, of wall panels, of these draping scrolls that are illegible, that nobody can read because all of the characters in them are fake. 
and he was accused of uh, just you know, producing something that was a waste of time, uh, which he loved. That was an idea that he really liked. And I think that that's something that you can see in um, Ai Weiwei's uh, sunflower seeds as well. So, okay, I think my time is up now. <laughs> so, Mark, let's see if I can get out of here. This will be the uh, last of the installments for the evening. Um, this is actually great. Uh, many of the things that Suzanne talked about, um, my talk should mesh as well. Um, it will also fill out some of the various gaps and spaces, um, overlap, overlap a little bit, and I hope in a pleasing manner. Um, so this is the sort of, um, opening image of the show, Dropping Urns. Um, Tonight I'm just going to give you a broader context to, to Ai Weiwei's work. Um, for some of you it might be a little bit of a repeat about what you know about history, and for you, those of you who don't know much, this will be um, a nice broad view of it. Um, we're going to start with the Mao era um, and before, actually we'll start at the end of the dynastic period. Um, work our way to Mao, and this is a, a one of these so-called big character posters from the main Cultural Revolution period. Um, come back down to, I hope many of you know who this might be. This is Deng Xiaoping. Um, this is actually a uh, poster or a billboard outside of Shenzhen, one of these economic zones. We'll see this major shift in um, Chinese policy, um, Chinese history, and I think the interaction between artists and the state. Um, we're going to talk about Ai Weiwei. Um, this is this famous bird's nest stadium that he's known for helping to design. Um, and at the same time, talk about maybe some of the things behind these stories that here it is being constructed. Um, the story of Ai Weiwei, his um, seeming support for the Olympics, but also his criticism of it and some of his political activities or perceived political activities. Um, and then we're going to talk about Ai Weiwei um, as a representation maybe of a larger set of interactions with the state. <clears throat> this is a, a graffiti artist's um, uh, spray painting of Ai Weiwei. This is in Hong Kong. This artist is Tangerine. And it says, um, Xie Hai Pa, Ai Weiwei. Who's afraid of Ai Weiwei? Um, these are plastered all over Hong Kong. This occurred. This is where we'll come to the end of the talk. It's where we are today and where Ai Weiwei is or is not at this um, and interestingly, she spray painted over <laughs> earlier graffiti here. You see the character for for I to love, and so it's actually part of a larger part of graffiti. But then also transposes this um, wonderful image, and maybe this is this um, is this is this the um, Ai Weiwei the Taoist, as Suzanne was talking about. Is this Ai Weiwei the Buddha? I don't know, but this image of him, this interesting, or the the Taoist. Um, so I'm going to give you a little sketch. I have a four-slide plan. We just saw slide number one in the nice mode of, of the uh, of, of um, socialist visions of, of progress. Um, we'll start with the historical framework. Um, look at the relationship between political and artistic expression. Talk about Ai Qing, Ai Weiwei, um, and then some of the fellow intellectuals. And put this in the context so we're going to lay the second part on top of the other, the previous part, and then we're going to look at observations, instances, um, in particular look at Ai Weiwei. Um, so just an outline of modern Chinese history. Um, I wouldn't be doing my professional job if I don't at least publicize and give you a framework. Um, traditional China, so basically anything before the beginning of the 20th century, before 1911, 
I'm talking about, I'm making a huge generalization here, but um, within the context of political discourse, um, one of the common modes within Confucian discourses at least um, is the scholar official, this critic of the state, but simultaneously the supporter of the state, somebody who is both um, potentially, you could say, subversive, but on a fundamental level has a duty to the state. Um, then 1911, we see the end of the dynastic system, beginning of uh, fundamental subversion and, and concern with um, this Confucian dynastic system. Um, 1912 to 1949, we have reform, revolution, war. Um, this is the period of um, imperialism. Western countries had been put in China under um, a huge amount of pressure. Um, and not just uh, Western countries, but I would say, I thought that on here it looks very stretched, but okay, good. Um, not just Western countries, but also within Asia, Japan is um, starting to sort of knock at the door, if not kicking down the door. Um, this nice little block of Li Hua, um, Roaring China, you see this, um, at this period intellectuals were very concerned and aware of the fact that um, something needed to be done. Um, China was under a lot of pressure. The, they were um, just had gone through this long period and were still under this long period of, of um, enforced importation of opium by the British and the various um, supporting states of the West. Um, you have Japan harking at the door, but also internally this concern for how do we reform, how do we um, reunite the state. This is a period of political division. You have warlords, you have um, disruption in the normal structures of the state. Um, at the same time, you have the rise of the Chinese Communist Party and also the Chinese Nationalist Party going down. These will become the two major forces. They'll have a nice um, civil war, which will end in 1949 with the Communist, Chinese Communist Party winning, and you have the Nationalists ending up in Taiwan. And we still have our situation today with the mainland being um, managed by the Communist, Chinese Communist Party and Taiwan being owned by the Nationalists. Um, here in 1949, just before this period, we see a young um, Mao Zedong. Um, this is at Yan'an. This is this enclave that, um, where the communists held out against both the nationalists and the Japanese um, before World War II and during World War II. This is um, one of these sort of proving grounds for um, Mao and his, his thought. This is a period of, of intense um, development within the Chinese Communist Party. Um, in the 50s, after the end of the Civil War, you see uh, reconstruction beginning, reconstruction from the fall of the dy dynastic system, reconstruction from the various imperialist wars, reconstruction from World War II, reconstruction from the Civil War. So you have this massive period, and early on it was very successful, um, at least the first four years or so of this four-year plan, um, brought China at least to pre-war period levels of production, and this is one of these Propaganda, wonderful propaganda posters showing this extreme development. Um, but then you started through a period of more challenges for intellectuals. Um, from 1949 um, up until around 1957 or so, um, there was a full participation by most intellectuals. There was a sense of, of vigor and excitement and um, um, full support for the state. Um, there, this is a period, the 100 Flowers campaign began. This is a campaign um, started um, mostly um, by the instigation of Mao um, to encourage people to criticize the state, to come up with suggestions. And this was actually due to um, mistakes that they perceived were going on in the Soviet Union. Um, well, that maybe went a little bit too well. The criticisms cut a little too close to um, Mao. Um, they became very powerful, in fact, um, which led to this anti campaign where um, you see people being um, denounced and removed from power, and this is the, actually the time when Ai Ching, Ai Weiwei's father, was um, um, said to do uh, labor in the countryside. He was supporting a very famous poet, um, um, Ding Ling. She was a, one of the early uh, supporters of the state, um, but a very outspoken activist, a very outspoken intellectual, um, and at this point, a little bit too unspoken, and uh, also found herself in trouble. 
Um, we have the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to uh, 76, as uh, uh, Suzanne said, um, this is a massive period of, of, of constant revolution of, of this, not just the destruction of um, art, artifacts, not just the sort of attempt at destruction of the past, but also a purging within society, this sense of displacing the fundamental, mostly what would be considered traditional family structures with the state where your direct association is not really with your family, but with your um, work unit or with the state itself. Um, we see here many people were also denounced during this period. Um, this is one of these posters. I'm actually talking about um, knocking down and crushing um, dung shopping. Staying here, what you see this uh, proletariat holding this, the, the collected works of Mao Zedong getting rid of Deng Xiaoping. So Deng Xiaoping is in, um, part of the early um, Communist Party. In various periods, he was in and out of power, in exile, or in often actual labor camps. Um, as we'll see, I noted in the first slide, he will eventually come back, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, again, I am galloping through this history. This is just a, a broad little thumbnail, so to give you some broader context of things you're going to talk about or have been talking about. Um, you see the passing of Mao Zedong, Joanne Mazi's fundamental change in 1976. There's a date that you should know about my modern Chinese history. This certainly is one of the major turning points. Um, you see the beginning of Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms, these four modernizations. This was actually a concept set up by Joanne Mazi in the previous the good guys within the early party. Um, but, and these are the, these wonderful modernizations. Here's a nice company in the poster about this. This is the uh, People's, um, the People's Republic Will Live Forever, is what it says at the bottom. Um, you have the wonderful emblem, and then you have all these modernizations, right? You, it is um, uh, set up as this uh, moving China um, into a, a competitive position with the rest of the world. Agriculture, you can see down here, you have these uh, farming fields, modern agriculture, right? With um, 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 tractors and basically industrialized production. You have seen industry over here on the right, technology, science. Um, this was Deng Xiaoping's vision. This was the vision of the state. Um, this is the vision also of the time when Ai Ching, Ai Weiwei's father, and Ai Weiwei were um, um, reformed and allowed to come back. Exile. Um, at the same time, you see the lecturers, you see Wei Jingsheng offering a fifth modernization. His fifth modernization is democracy. And this is an image from um, one of these walls that were set up in various in parts of Beijing, but this is a famous one, the democracy wall, where people will put up these big character posters in the same mode as the previous um, revolution of the communist revolution, of the cultural revolution. Um, it is also the same mode that is being deployed um, within these democracy movements. Um, zooming way ahead, we see this Tiananmen Square incident. So you, it's right after this, with the four modernizations, you see repression of this um, democracy movement. You see repression of this fifth modernization. Um, and you see, actually, at the same time, a large number of people start to depart from China. Um, um, Ai Weiwei was um, about three years after this, um, but there are a large number of, of intellectuals, writers, authors, Gu Chong, um, um, Zhang Dali, and so forth, people departing at right about this time. Um, many of these, uh, what will become uh, fairly well-known names in the art world, and in, I would say also literary world, um, during this time are, are abroad. Um, we have this Tiananmen Square incident. Uh, I'm sure this image has been closed into our minds, our consciousness of the rest of the world. It was one unknown famous um, person who stood up in front of these tanks. Um, and this is an image that moved many people, both uh, Chinese intellectuals in the sense of, um, both in the sense of uh, fear and concern, but also that um, 
things need to change. Um, you have the Beijing Olympics, just this uh, powerful sort of regrouping of energy. Um, many of the people that were just concerned by these Tiananmen Square incidents, and I think we start to see um, uh, a re-energizing of the intellectuals, and, and the actual uh, many people start to return. Um, and this is this great image. You see a play on the traditional past done by the, the, the state itself, right? This is in the form of a traditional Chinese seal. This, this is the graph for Jing, for, for, for capital of the Beijing Jing. It's also this morphing into a figure running. Um, so you see tradition and modernity brought wonderfully together. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm going to now take this sort of structure and start to lay um, I Ching and I Wei Wei upon it. Um, sorry, I have been on and off airplanes for the past couple of days, so I'm trying to keep my mouth flowing. Um, so let's, we start to talk about reform. Um, this is this is actually I Ching, uh, and this is at Yan'an. So this is Yan'an. This is enclave of the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party before they took power. Um, here he is with an actual peasant. Um, he is, this is a period where the Chinese Communist Party took, uh, well, had previously, but really uh, fundamentally um, committed to a, a link between the party and the peasantry uh, as a form of, of Maoist communism, linking the, um, um, taking the peasantry as the fundamental version of workers as opposed to the industrial workers as we saw in the Soviet Union. And this is one of the sort of beginning areas where you see a, a departure between um, um, Russia and China. And this is Ai Ching, um, Ai Weiwei's father. Um, he's a poet, a wonderful poet. He wrote just before this period this, uh, just a, a, such a, a moving piece on the uh, Cold Wind Over China, it is, has been translated. Um, it's a wonderful moving piece linking his experiences with those of, of the peasantry, of farming. Um, himself was educated as an artist, a painter, um, studied in France in the 20s. Um, I think he went there when he was 19. Um, and came back, was arrested by the woman down by the nationalists for his leftist positions, and then eventually finds himself here again on. With Mao and the rest of the party. He was one of a powerful figure in the party, one of the poets of the party, and along with Ding Ling. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, during the Hundred Flowers campaign, him and his family were sent into exile. Um, you see, basically, and during the Hundred Flowers campaign, he was sent up to Manchuria, so up here in the north. Um, and then during the Cultural Revolution, oops, he was sent over to the Xinjiang, as you can said. And it's actually very much up, he was sent very much up into the northern border um, Russia. And this is out on the prairies and plains. It's this is a very um, desolate place. His father, um, his main job was to clean the toilets in their village, um, a village of 200 people. Um, and if you're in half red, um, there's a publication of of Ai Weiwei's blog postings. He has, I thought about him, but he has this massive blog collection. He talks about this as well. Um, and it's at this time, at least in part, that you can see a link between these sunflower seeds. He, he makes this wonderful comment. I grew up in the desert, and sunflower seeds were actually, this is one of the seeds in America, were actually a street snack uh, regarding the Chinese propaganda. So the, the, many of these posters that we've seen, uh, we are all sunflowers because we are all facing the sun. That is, the sun is Mao Zedong. And as I saw, we saw in the beginning slide here is Mao, this great sun shining across um, the world, actually. Um, and you see here at the bottom it says, the proletariat of the world come together to knock down the imperialist America. And this is a period when the United States is this great follower of. Uh, challenging power. The United States at this time is supporting Taiwan in opposition to um, um, the mainland China, is supporting, uh, as opposed to Russia, when we have a very strong relationship, at least putatively strong relationship between China and 
Russia. Um, and you see this mass of workers from all parts of the world are, are uh, displayed. You actually see the uh, mushroom cloud over on the right side of, and this is the, basic, the time period when China uh, developed the nuclear bomb. Um, Cultural Revolution, again, this family, again, were off um, in exile, um, 16, 16 years. Um, and then we'll jump ahead. This is a, even in uh, I Ching's uh, poetry, you see him basically um, not being able to write anything throughout this whole period. You see the last of his poetry ending in 1958 and then picking up again when he was brought back in 1970. Um, I really talks about how they had to get rid of many of their books in the collection and then all part of this destruction that we've talked about already. Um, and I think this must have had some direct visceral effect on I would assume I would weigh in, in, in he actually talks about it in his own visions of, of uh, responding to that. Um, so Dong Xiaoping comes in, um, and Ai Qing and Ai Weiwei, his family, are, are brought back, um, and are become, this is, this is Ai Qing, um, become a, a really cultural hero. He is, he, he is still thought of as one of the sort of great poets of the modern Chinese, Chinese communist um, era, and, and he is really a wonderful poet. I mean, his responses are, are very uh, um, approachable. Um, and this is the time, actually, just after this, that we see um, Ai Weiwei heading off to New York, packing up his, his uh, few belongings, heading off, uh, asserting that he would become a great artist. I think he, he said as he was leaving, and this is, this is his neighbor, um, and Ginsburg, as has been noted, this is this is them together. I'm not quite sure where they are. It looks like some sort of um, cafe. Um, he was uh, he was away during this uh, Tiananmen Square incident, but he he was uh, protesting in the United States. He led several campaigns, so if you see him still as an act, fully active activist, even if his the, his pieces or his works of art hadn't necessarily survived or were not as productive as they could have been. Beijing Olympics. You see him coming back to, to um, Beijing in 1993, something like that, um, um, due to his father's health. Um, and you see him beginning to participate um, with the state. His father is a powerful, powerfully connected figure with the state. Deng Xiaoping was exiled at a very similar time and place to Ai Qing. Um, Deng Xiaoping comes back. I, 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 she comes back. Um, he, they are um, a strongly um, related family to the, to the state, and I think there's a, at least early on there was a lot of resistance to, to taking too strong of a dislike to I really, really, at least early on. Early on, and they really wanted, uh, you know, a Chinese um, um, designer as well connected to this project, as so we have. This bird's in a stadium. Um, at the same time, you see some resistance, some, at least just before this period and through this period, some um, concern about what does it mean? What, is the, what do the Olympics mean? What do they stand for? What, what physically happens in Beijing when you're going to set up the Olympics? Right? What are you going to do to the city? Well, um, one of the big concerns was this destruction of the past, this destruction of these traditional housing, houses. You have Huangria. So in the piece in 1905, this um, China, this um, knocking down things, um, and you see this juxtaposition of images of, of traditional roof lines, these ceramic roof tiles with buildings that have been taken down. This chai, this graph at the top here, is a graph that is spray painted on buildings when they're going to be demolished. So you see these buildings, trees, structures around the city with this drizzly spray paint coming down them for destruction, for demolition. So he says this sort of challenge to progress, or challenge to perceive progress, to, to um, purging of the past and the, the sort of traditions. And I would say this piece by I would have is, is similar to this. This is similar from Beijing. This is a uh, piece of a Qing Dynasty temple. Um, and it's in a nice little box coffin, maybe. Um, questioning this 
this destruction is. And this was also um, dates to slightly before the Olympics, but this sort of um, discourse of, of concern is, has, has been long term, but the, the Olympics really brought it to the forefront. Um, we'll just talk a little bit more. This is our fourth in our four slide plan. Um, this is a quote by Ai Weiwei. Um, my work is always dealing with real or fake authenticity and value, and how value relates to current political, social understanding and misunderstanding. And I think this misunderstanding maybe is also a very important aspect here. Um, but value, authenticity, real, fake. And you see the, the sort of running so, um, discourse between these things. And this is clearly at the core of many Taoist teachings, minimally, and certainly, I'd say, um, um, this uh, Chan Buddhism as well. Um, one of his major uh, serendipitous occurrences in his life, he was this, this uh, web portal, um, Sina.com, asked him to start a blog site. He'd be one of their celebrity bloggers in 1980, or 2005, and he was a little resistant at first, but Boy, did he take to it uh, in full force. He really was spending hours and hours updating in this stream of consciousness. This is where maybe he began to get in his most trouble um, with the state because he was uh, very openly um, um, resisting and, and denouncing a actions of the state. And he moved to Twitter um, once they closed down his account there at the other portal. And he, he makes this funny relationship between writing to Twitter and the quotes of Mao Zedong in his, his little red book because they are both as short as that. So any quote from Mao Zedong could be in a, as a Twitter quote. Um, and you see him playing between these things, his experience um, as a youth during the Cultural Revolution, but also as a modern um, intellectual and in trying to maybe um, navigate those two spaces into one. Um, 2008.